I am Robert M. Price, the old Bible geek, but this isn't the Bible geek, of course. This is the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, just a little preliminary uh, wheel spinning here. I I've just uh, learned that we have a sizable group of ardent Gnostics and those interested in Gnosticism and other uh, uh, related uh, esotericisms. I'm I'm very interested in all that stuff, and I'm very very flattered at the interest taken in my stuff by uh, people who uh, are eager to hear me deal with uh, Gnosticism, its various versions and its scriptures. And uh, I'm I'm trying to to think, and maybe you you can give me some feedback on this as to whether I should dare try to do a third regular program about Gnosticism, etc., or I should just uh, continue with the, the four traditional Gospels and go right from the last one, the Gospel of John, into the, uh, the Apocryphon of John from Nag Hammadi, and then do various other ones. Uh, so I'm still thinking that over, so I'd be real interested in, in what you think uh, I, I might uh, do. So, okay, well, with that, uh, let me uh, once again urge you to uh, go over to um, YouTube to uh, subscribe to our, our programs and so forth. That would really be great. And uh, with that, what say we plunge right into uh, chapter uh, three? Uh, is this? Yeah, that's it. Um, where we skip all the way to Jesus' adulthood. And it says, uh, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, right there, we got to stop. Uh, Mark would has in in his version says uh, the kingdom of God and throughout uh, his gospel it's the kingdom of God the kingdom of God but Matthew uh, changes almost every one of those you know because he takes over a lot of stuff from Mark uh, he changes it to kingdom of heaven uh, why would he do that well it's easy to explain he is kind of an ultra pious Jewish Christian. And uh, there was this attempt, you know, where in the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be thy name. Uh, well, uh, yeah, to to reverence the name of God. Don't just throw it around. Uh, it goes way back to the commandment that says, do not take the name of Yahweh your God in vain. And the, the rabbinical or the scribal deliberations over what exactly would that mean? It definitely seemed to have meant breach of contract because you swore you would do your duty in the deal here by by the name of Yahweh. As Yahweh lives, don't worry, I'll have that job done under time and below cost. Well, you better do it then. Or perjury, because you would be put on the stand and they'd say, as uh, give glory to Yahweh. And you would reply, as Yahweh lives, I didn't do so and so. Uh, because there's nothing more true than that Yahweh lives. So at least it had to mean that. But did it also uh, imply uh, the use of uh, the name Yahweh as a magical formula? Well, could have. Uh, eventually people did that. Uh, and then they began to say, well, really, who knows what it would be? Uh, maybe we better play it safe and uh, just um, avoid using it in any kind of common parlance at all. Uh, because who knows? Does it mean like saying it uh, casually, like in uh, the life of Brian? But all I said was this halibut is good enough for Jehovah. And then you're going to stone him to death. Uh, so they they finally got to the point where even if you're doing a reading of the text in the synagogue and uh, the name Yahweh comes up as it does incessantly throughout the text, right? You would, uh, and there, there might even be a little marker in the text reminding you, don't say it. Say Adonai instead, uh, which means Lord and was also a divine name, like Adonis is another god with that name. But it was somehow not as sacred as the Tetragrammaton, the four-letter name, right? And in, in transliterated, it would be Y-H-W-H. And hence, we get the Yahweh from that. Uh, so... Um, 
the the first step was let's not say it at all with the sole exception that the high priest on the day of atonement uh, in the holy of holies can say once Yahweh uh, that really builds up the uh, m the mystical reverential cachet of the thing so uh, not a bad idea I guess uh, well that led that kind of crept uh, over from like uh, Derrida speaks of the the slippage along the chain of signifiers. Uh, well, yeah, uh, they they then began to say, you know, uh, maybe we shouldn't even say God. Uh, that that uh, Elohim. Um, that's uh, not the one we were actually told not to say. Uh, but uh, what the heck? It is the name of God. Maybe we should uh, also give that one a rest. And they began to say heaven or the eternal, or the power, uh, and uh, or the name, Hashem, you'd know who they meant, but they wouldn't be taking the risk of dragging the name of God around. Well, Matthew uh, figures, yeah, I feel a little uncomfortable having Jesus say, uh, kingdom of God. I mean, there, there are pious Jews today who will not write the, the, the G-O-D, right? It'll be G-D. Uh, and uh, it's all for this idea, which I certainly am not ridiculing, right? Just explaining. They were taking it very seriously. And, and so that's why Matthew, no doubt, changes it to kingdom of heaven. And uh, a couple of places he, he forgets. It's what, uh, oh, what's his name? Um the guy that uh, wrote the book about the Q. Uh, no, I can't think of it at the moment, but he speaks of this editorial ang uh, editorial fatigue that after a while you just uh, forget to do it. You've done it so many times to make those changes. Okay, so he's saying, um, uh, let's see, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I, I guess I'm, I'm going on at length about this just because the point of it usually in any of the gospels when they speak of the kingdom of god uh, it may it means that uh, the time when god will rule unopposed uh, when uh, when the the ages uh, turn and uh, we're dealing with the messianic era the, <coughs> the resurrection of the dead the defeat of the demons and the romans and so forth yeah that's going to be the great day when god assumes hands-on rule of, of the world. That will be the reign uh, of the kingdom of God, not so much a place, but a time, right? And um, if, when you say kingdom of heaven, that kind of tempts you to think, oh, you mean heaven above, where, where God rules. Like, uh, when I die, I will go into the kingdom of heaven if I've been a good boy. Uh, and <clears throat> and usually that doesn't seem to me be the intended meaning. So you got to be careful, and I will pedantically test your patience by pointing that out when it comes up. Uh, and uh, so he's preaching that the, you know, the, the last day, the final judgment is on its way, good old John. Uh, and he wants you to repent. In other words, change your ways, metanoia, repentance, changing your mind, uh, not just your opinions, right? But, you know, taking, uh, turning over a whole new leaf. And um, then we got a comment. Again, this is derived from Mark. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord of Adonai, make his path straight. What does that have to do with it? Well, in the context of Isaiah, it, it meant prepare the way for the Jewish exiles to come back from Babylon and Persia when the exile is over. Uh, and so it, it, the... Uh, it, the wilderness is where you are preparing the way, smoothing out the road, making travel easy and direct to get, to get back to the Holy Land. But here they're taking it to uh, mean the voice is crying in the wilderness about preparing the way of the Lord 
in some general terms. And of course, uh, John the Baptist means it as uh, uh, prepare uh, yourselves to to receive him and so on. But but this because there the, John the Baptist is depicted as kind of a desert hermit. So his is the lone voice crying in the wilderness where there's virtually nobody to hear, though people tend to like John and flock to him, actually. Uh, so, uh, and, and of course, you know, in the background here, they're saying, well, the the uh, the way of the Lord is the way of Jesus. And, uh, and so John is preparing his way. He's the front man announcing, you know, uh, extra, extra, you know, the coming one is on his way. Now, here is one of the rare cases where the appearance of a biblical character is described. And there's, it's so rare, it's obvious that uh, you need to know something uh, about it. Uh, and that's why you're being told, whereas ordinarily the person's appearance doesn't make any difference. Like you, you hear about Zacchaeus being short uh, because you need to know it because it, it's why he has to climb the tree to see Jesus passing by. Uh, otherwise, you know, there's uh, the story sort of falls flat. So you need to know he was a shrimpy guy. Now, John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather girdle around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. I, maybe this is where Bill Gates got the idea. I don't know. Um, uh, some people have said, you know, this guy sounds like an Essene or like one of the group that uh, wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls because they lived in the wilderness. Uh, they dressed simply, not necessarily with the hair shirt business, uh, but uh, the their diet was the same. They in the Dead Sea Scrolls you actually have a recipe for roasts locusts uh, and uh, and and wild honey. Uh, so uh, yeah, I mean there were a lot of hermits and sectarians and so forth. So it wouldn't necessarily mean he's part of uh, the Qumran community, but who knows? Could be. Uh, that's uh, in fact. Um, uh, in the pseudo-Clementine uh, literature, it, it says that John the Baptist had a sect with 30 members uh, because it had to do with the the, uh, the calendar they followed and so on, uh, and um, that they were a monastic community in the desert. So, you know, maybe that, if that's true, maybe that group was the Qumran uh, community. Who, who knows? I've mentioned this occasionally because I, I always connected with Simon Magus, who supposedly was a disciple of John the Baptist, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, uh, what about this uh, hair shirt the guy is wearing? Well, it's it's like he's wearing an Elijah costume because when uh, Elijah is described, and again, remember. Almost nobody ever is in the Bible, so it's telling you something. Uh, Elijah was originally a sun god, uh, and so the the hair and the fur and all that symbolized the uh, the the rays of the sun, just like Samson's long hair did, right? And um, and that no longer has an explicit solar connection in the stories we are reading where Elijah has been kind of reduced or humanized to a miracle working prophet. He's not a god, but he used to be. And the uh, since as a god, as the sun god, uh, he, he was depicted with a light rays coming off him, uh, that got converted, or you might say demythologized, uh, when they humanized this this being uh, into the hair shirt of an ascetic that Elijah was wearing, and for John the Baptist uh, to be wearing. Now, is, is this evidence that John the Baptist was presenting himself as the fulfillment of Malachi's prophecy that before the great and terrible day of Yahweh that uh, he would send Elijah uh, to kick butt and get everybody uh, together and on the right team with God and so forth? Um, who
can stand when he appears. You know, it's going to be a big thing when it, when it happens. Is that the point here? Well, he's almost like saying, you know, hey, I'm Elijah. You know, you recognize the uniform, right? Like if a guy comes in with a Superman costume, you know who he thinks he is or who he's masquerading as anyway. Well, the same thing here. Unless this had become the garb for prophets in general. Because in uh, Zechariah, part of it written at a time when they were trying to close down the uh, office of a prophet. They didn't want to hear any more of that. They wanted to stick with canonical scripture, not, you know, uh, loose cannons out there, uh, gumming up the works with new prophecies. Oh, geez, no, I, you, you're a rock of the boat, buddy. Uh, well, it said that if anybody is found to be wearing the hair shirt and so forth, don't listen to them. Meaning that uh, not that they're necessarily Elijah, but that everybody was following the pattern of Elijah uh, in their dress. Well, it was good enough for Elijah. It's good enough for any other prophets. So you can't really be sure if, if John was implicitly claiming to be the returned prophet Elijah, or if he's just saying, yeah, I I'm the latest prophet. I guess it doesn't much matter, but, you know, again, we are putting the old uh, 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 looking glass, the old uh, microscope on the, uh, on the text, and we want to wring everything out of it we can. So what is he doing? Uh, let's see. Uh, in verse, boy, oh boy, I, I need new, new glasses here. Uh, in verse... Um, Five, I guess it is, then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan. And they were baptized by him, that is by John, uh, in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. In other words, they figured, well, I know my rap sheet. I, I know the things I've done. I, I have a hunch they weren't as microscopically neurotic as we are. They know. Was that an unkind thought? I used to be this way when I was a teenage fundamentalist, uh, and it drove me nuts. Uh, well, apparently these people hadn't gotten that, you know, neurotically introspective, but they knew they had done this and that, and uh, they figured, well, geez, if, if the final judgment is at hand, I, I better see if I can clear my my rap sheet. I can confess what I did, and if, if this is going to wash away those sins, great, uh, just in time. Uh, so specific confessions, well, John, I did this, and I did that, and I did the other thing, and then John's looking at his, his wrist sun dial and says, all right, that's cut it short, buddy, we haven't got all day here. Um, and so, uh, seven, uh, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit that, re that befits repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, you know, so I don't need this, you know, I'm set already. Uh, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Little pun there. Um, sons of, of Abraham would be Benny, B-E-N-I, in, in uh, our, our uh, alphabet. Uh, and and uh, stones would be Abeni, uh, like in... Uh, Ebenezer, uh, here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by uh, thy grace I'm come, whatever it is. That's from Joshua, and uh, it, it meant stone of help. It was a, a monument that God has gotten us this far. And uh, so, Ezer, yeah. Um, or, or um, no, I'm sorry, that's not it. Uh, the other, uh, Ebene, is uh, that he can raise up sons from the stones. It almost works as a pun in English. And uh, so he says, 
it doesn't matter whether we're all Jews here, right? Does that mean everybody's perfect? That we're we're uh, immune to sin? Uh, you guys seem to think that uh, you're uh, you're above it. Uh, yeah, I don't need this. Though it does say that uh, they came to be baptized. And I guess uh, John has a dim view of these people and thinks they're just doing it for show. What are you doing here? I, and he says, don't go saying, well, as a you know, son of Abraham in good standing, I, I'm really okay as I am. Well, why are you here? You're just trying to, to display your piety before others, something we'll read about in a couple of chapters. And uh, that's, uh, you're just kidding yourself. You're making a mockery of this. Uh, and uh, are they really worried about the, the facing the judgment or are they just trying to get more brownie points for the public? Okay, and uh, then John reiterates the lateness of the hour. He says, um, uh, in verse uh, 10, even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Uh, um, every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Well, what fruit, right? He, well, he just said, uh, if you really uh, are serious about repentance, then show it by uh, the results of genuine repentance, that you've changed your ways. But in fact, you're just here to, to uh, garner a claim. Oh, even those guys are humble enough. You, you're making a mockery of this. Uh, and uh, he says, um, you're liable to wind up uh, in the, uh, in the, uh, the wood pile here, that he's going to chop down the ones that aren't showing the real fruit of repentance. And I don't think you guys are going to qualify. Then he goes into what, and this sounds kind of like the Dead Sea Scrolls too, in verse 11, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. It's interesting in Mark, which he's copying from, is that I'm not worthy to untie his shoes. Well, here I can't even carry him, so he's, uh, he's even more humble in, in Matthew. Uh, he will uh, baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the granary, the righteous, right? Uh, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Uh, well, a couple of cross-references here. Uh, the Voltman says that the reference to uh, he's going to baptize in the Holy Spirit must be an anachronism, that this is uh, written by a Christian, a Jewish Christian, and that he's thinking of like the Holy Spirit in a Christian context and conferred in baptism or by the laying on of hands. But uh, actually, and then he could be right, that, that does make sense to me. But in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it speaks of the, uh, the wrath of God poured out on the last day and it specifically says he will he will pour out fire and spirit perhaps meaning wind uh, and uh, so you, you're in for big trouble if you're not on the right side of things so even this might mark John as a, as an Essene or whatever uh, he's going to get him with unquenchable fire that is going to come up in Matthew 24 in the sheep and goats story, right? When the Son of Man comes, he'll sit on his glorious throne. He'll divide the nations before him as the shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. And, and uh, the, uh, the goats represent those uh, nations or towns, etc., that uh, rejected the preaching of the gospel by the disciples of Jesus. And uh, it, it's not thought of in terms of individuals there. Uh, it's whole groups. And uh, the, the goats are those, and uh, they are going to be thrown into the fire that is eternal. And now, that's interesting because that's one of the few hints as to whether Matthew thought that 
hell was going to be eternal that is eternal suffering or whether it was it's just a fire that doesn't go out and you will be uh, incinerated in it and dead that's sometimes called annihilationism right uh, i don't think it's very clear though i tend to think it, it would fit best if you thought of it as the place of eternal torment a kind of nasty idea that uh, makes a mockery of the idea of a loving god but what the heck i should editorialize i guess so there are connections you need to keep these things in mind when you get to uh, references to the same things later on it, would, it takes a while right it, it may take years before you start seeing other uh, kindred uh, references, cross-references um, uh, with, uh, uh, with a sort of a synoptic view, right? That's what we, we mean by synoptic gospels. They sort of have the, the same, uh, same perspective. Okay, now Jesus comes into the picture in verse 13. Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Uh, but Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, uh, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. What does that mean? Uh, well, I think that means in the context that uh, to fulfill the commandments is to obey them. And he's saying this is an act of righteousness. Uh, and, uh, and we ought to do it because it is, even if strictly speaking, we wouldn't have to. Because John obviously means you're no sinner. What have you got to confess? And in fact, Jesus doesn't confess anything. But he says we ought to go through with it, like to be a good example or, or whatever. Now, what's ironic about this to me and this is no criticism by any means, it's just an irony that um, John has just accused the, the uh, Pharisees and Sadducees uh, of, of being, being hypocrites because they say, yeah, I know you, you're not repenting, you're just going through the motions to keep up a, a good uh, image. Uh, and because you're not really repenting, well, here it's a strange parallel because uh, Jesus doesn't need to repent. I mean, that's what the, the Pharisees and scribes are thinking, but Jesus actually doesn't need to repent, but he too wants to go through it for appearance sake, uh, not to make himself look good, but to, uh, I, the way I read it anyway, is to say, well, this is what uh, the righteous are doing. We should identify with that. Uh, and so, um, both of them, for different reasons, don't need to be or, or, or are, be, are seeking baptism for appearances sake. But in the one case, it's to uh, just falsely puff themselves up and enhance their reputation for holiness. And in the other, uh, it's uh, just, well, let's let's do this thing. It's, it's a righteous act. Um, presumably, uh, Jesus uh, would have been... Uh, keeping the Passover feast uh, or, or uh, uh, participated in the Day of Atonement, though he had no uh, sins to atone for, but he would have lived a, a faithful uh, Jewish life. Okay, now that stuff isn't explicitly stated, but this comes pretty close to that, I think. Uh, let's see. Uh, so then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Well, uh, this is a little different than Mark, right? Uh, different from Mark, I should say, right? Uh, um, let's see. Um, in Mark, Jesus sees the heavens opened, implying that it might have been a vision that other people would not have seen this. Uh, they wouldn't necessarily have seen a dove come down and alight on the the shoulder of Jesus or whatever. Uh, and... Uh, 
but that he saw that this was his calling vision, like Isaiah in chapter 6, uh, that uh, he sees Adonai sitting on a throne and uh, he says, uh, you know, I've got a mission. Who should I send? And Jesus says, uh, Isaiah says, oh, me right here. I'll, I'll do it. And uh, then he gives him the commission. It, it, something like that. But the voice speaks to the crowd, not to Jesus. He doesn't say, you are my beloved son. He says, hey, this is my beloved son. Uh, so uh, it's more of a objective uh, uh, experience and uh, that uh, the public should take the hint, you know, hey, this guy is something else. Um, let's see, something else I wanted to mention. Uh, yeah, uh, well, the big whopping uh, difference between uh, this and Mark, Matthew's source, is that in Mark, we're, we're given no hint that John the Baptist knew Jesus was different from anybody else, just, you know, the next guy in line. Uh, but here, uh, he knows him as soon as he sees him. What a bunch of good shave you like you doing in a place like this. You know, why are you even here? Uh, and uh, that is that is totally different than Mark. I mean, you can't just say Mark, well, he must have known it, but left it out. Why? I mean, th this looks real good for Jesus, right? And uh, the... Um, so we we've got uh, it matters to Matthew and Luke uh, that uh, though though John baptized him, it was incongruous because of the nature of who Jesus was, and so uh, this sort of works off the embarrassment, right? In Mark, it's simply stated, yeah, this is a baptism of repentance. People uh, stood in the water and confessed their sins, and then you had it washed away. Uh, and uh, what, wait a minute, why would Jesus do that, right? And, and Matthew, in his day, that has become an embarrassment because the Christology, the understanding of Christ has kind of expanded so that he, he's absolutely sinless and uh, not on balance righteous, but absolutely righteous. Well, why would he come? And so it says, well, uh, he didn't really need to. And John even knew that from one look at the guy. Uh, but he said, yeah, I know. Let, let's go through it uh, anyway. I don't think this is much of an explanation. But the, the real point of it is to reassure the reader, hey, look, don't get the wrong idea. Why did Jesus, if he was totally righteous, go for baptism? Uh, you got me there, but at least it wa it wasn't because he was a sinner, right? And that's really what he's trying to get across, even though it, it, his attempt to wiggle out of it is is of limited effectiveness, right? So uh, Jesus is declared the beloved Son of God, and now we're going to see if he uh, if he's the right man for the job. Uh, will he really uh, pass the test? And that again, this is a lot like uh, Mark, but in in some ways very different. Um, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Why in the wilderness? Well, there's limited options there and uh, sort of an extreme survivor kind of a thing. Let's see if he can deal with this, uh, but also because uh, demons were believed uh, to inhabit the desert. They didn't like it, who would? Uh, so they're, they're seeking a nice, warm, damp place in a human body, right? And that's why they possess people. Um, so they, they live in the desert otherwise. So that's where he's got to go if he's going to meet Satan, right? the, uh, the, the one who uh, tests the righteous to see if they're really what they're cracked up to be. And so in advance, let me say, I, I think that this is one of those places where the point is not to get Jesus to sin, but it's rather to see if he will, because if he's the son of God, he should be above that uh, yielding to temptations, because that is what happens. Uh, are you what you're cracked up to be? I mean, the heavenly voice said you're the son of God, but let's let's just be sure. Uh, let's see. And, okay, um, uh, 
verse uh, 2, And he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward he was hungry, to say the least, I guess. Uh, and the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Uh, this business of his being uh, hungry, fasting for the whole time, that is an in mark, right? He is out in the desert for that length of time, but it says the angels ministered to him, which really has to mean they fed him. I mean, the parallel is with Elijah in the wilderness where the angels brought him food. So I, I think this is a, a really different alternative version of the, uh, of the what, or trying to answer the question, oh, what was he, how was he being tested out there? Oh, this is an imaginative uh, way to fill in that blank. And uh, you'll notice that what what uh, Matthew is setting up is a parallel between Jesus and the people of Israel uh, in their wilderness wanderings. Wilderness, right? They're out there in the sand and the heat and all that. And uh, they're constantly griping to Moses and to God. You know, how long do we have to do this? And where's some food, some decent food? And uh, we're, we're uh, getting parched out here. Is there a water fountain anywhere nearby? And, and Moses sort of reluctantly, or God, uh, says, okay, okay, here you go, complainer. So it's hunger, just like it was there in Deuteronomy. Uh, and the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So, okay, what do you know? I, I'm not really hungry for that. You know, it's uh, the real famine is a famine of the word of God in the land, I think Joel says. And uh, so, I, I'm sorry, or this is just like what he says in John chapter 4. Uh, you know, Master, eat! And he says, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. Exactly the same notion, right? Uh, but he's quoting uh, the the book of Deuteronomy, I think. Um then uh, the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, the highest point of the thing, right? And said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for is it is written, he, I think this is from the Psalms, he will give his angels charge of you, and in another place, uh, on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. So God has really got your back. Uh, he's not going to let anything happen to you. Uh, and uh, in fact, if you trip and fall, don't worry. Uh, he'll send angels to pick you up before you can hit the ground. So let's, uh, let's just test out that hypothesis. Why don't you jump? Uh, and uh, Jesus says uh, um, in verse uh, 7, Again, it is written, You shall not tempt Adonai your God. Uh, right, he's, uh, he's saying, Yeah, I, I, perhaps that's true, but if I do that to, to prove God will uh, you know, rescue me in midair, I'm just... Uh, making him do tricks. I have no right to do that. You're tempting the Lord your God that way. Hey, let's see if he'll do this. Uh, I say jump and God says how high. That's kind of what you pick up from some of the prosperity gospel preachers. God has become a genie or a butler that you can order around. Oh, how revolting. Uh, and Jesus is saying, no, I'm not going to do that, but we're forbidden to do that. Okay, uh, again, verse 8, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said to him, 
All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written. Uh, yeah, I know the rest of it, but I want to make sure I get it right. You shall worship Adonai your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Right, that last line he he took from the uh, from Mark's much briefer version. Uh, so let me uh, get this straight again. Jesus is being depicted as a new Israel uh, personified into one single figure, and whereas God grudgingly acceded to the griping demands of, of the, the Israelites. Well, I almost wish we hadn't left Egypt. We at least had uh, good food there, but here, oh my God. Uh, and okay, okay, here you go. Here's some quails for you. Here's some manna for you. Here's some water for you. That'll keep you quiet. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, Jesus passes all these tests, right? He He's not complaining. And so, um, why does the third temptation read as it does? The devil says, look, I'm in charge here, and there's a spoil system. I give power to the various rulers, and uh, you could be one of them. In fact, you could rule the whole thing. What do you say? You just have to sign on with me. Uh, it's like... Uh, uh, George Bailey, with when Mr. Potter is saying, "Well, George, uh, you know, you could, uh, I'd like you to work for me," and so on. And he says, "Oh, gee, Mr. Potter, that's that's mighty kind of you." But uh, and then he, he shakes hands with him and looks at his hand as if it's got hideous slime on. He says, "No, no, you're, you're just nothing more than a big spider." And uh, well, yeah, that's the same temptation. He uh, he, but Jesus doesn't hesitate as long as George Bailey did, right? He's like, get out of here. Uh, that's that's ridiculous. Uh, what does he mean, worship? Uh, it, it, he doesn't necessarily mean, I want you to start sacrificing virgins and stuff like that. I want you to become a sa Satanist cultist. No, it, it just means to... Uh, uh, to uh, venerate him, to swear fealty, uh, like the knight kneeling before the king. He's not worshiping him as a god, but he's he's uh, he's showing submission and allegiance, and uh, that's what the the devil wants. And Jesus says, "No, my allegiance goes to to God alone." And of course, that's kind of what the devil was probably hoping he would say, right? He's he's putting him through his paces and, and saying, "Let's see if this guy is." Is, uh, really fit, he'll see through these temptations. If he isn't, if he's just a stupid kid and falls for it, then it'll be back to the drawing board. But he doesn't, right? Jesus does pass the test. And that's what's going on here in my estimation, that he's not uh, trying to get Jesus to uh, betray his uh, his role as the son of God, etc. He's just making sure that Jesus is the right man for the job, and it turns out he is. Well, the Deuteronomy thing, this goes right through that temptation because what happens at, at the end of the period of wilderness wandering in, in uh, Deuteronomy? Uh, Moses has been forbidden to go into the promised land uh, with the people because of some technical infraction that God uh, couldn't overlook. And he says, but I want you to see this. And they go up Mount Nebo. And, uh, and he's, he says, now take a look at this on the plane here. Here are all the little kingdoms your people are going to conquer. You know, Edom, Moab, Ammon, and so forth. Uh, you won't be leading them, but at least you can get a look at, at what uh, they're going to take over. Well, it seems to me that is the origin of this, uh, and that uh, it that Matthew has created it along with the rest of the story to uh, say that Jesus is like Moses, only he didn't goof, uh, and um, uh, and so on. Well, um, Luke. Th this brings up a, an interesting thing. It may be too arcane for your taste, but. 
you know how the Q theory says that the material that Matthew and Luke both have that they did not get from Mark, they must have gotten from this source. Don't know what it would have been called, but they call it Q for the German Quella or source. So the other saying source. And that it's all just about all uh, sayings. Uh, sometimes there's a little bit of a running start giving you a, a little bit of a background so that the saying will be understandable as a punchline, right? But it's, it's, uh, but people always say, well, this uh, doesn't quite fit the pattern because if the temptations of, of the devil weren't in Mark, and they're not, right? But they're in both Matthew and Luke. Um, that must mean it was in Q. Well, no, it doesn't. Because once you factor Marcio in an ear, and you realize that his uh, short gospel of the Lord, or the Evangelicon, uh, uh, did not have this, as the church fathers who had a copy in front of them said, you know, there's no temptation narrative here. Uh, that and that was uh, that was because his the Marcionite gospel was sort of an earlier version of Luke, to which much was later added to make it our canonical Luke. Uh, well, if that's the case, then that means whoever supplemented the uh, the short version of Marcion added the temptation which he got from Matthew. So Q would not have contained this long story. Uh, it is mainly um, just short aphorisms and, and, uh, and proverbs and so on. So I, I think that's worth noting. I, I may be ignorant, but I've never read anyone saying that, but it seems clear to me and maybe to you. Uh, let's see, are we, I think we're coming up into the uh, the um, Sermon on the Mount. But no, we still do have a bit more good that ought to round us out. In uh, 12, verse of chapter 4, verse 12. Now, when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he went and dwelt in Capernaum by the sea, both of them in uh, this assumes there was a, a Nazareth populated at the time, uh, though apparently it was not in, in the time Jesus is supposed to have lived, but there it had been rebuilt and re-inhabited by the time the Gospels were written, so they assumed Jesus had been in Nazareth. Okay, so, uh, but Nazareth and Capernaum are both in Galilee. Um, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, uh, that is two of the uh, ancient tribes of Israel. Uh, that what and why this happened? I mean, you can think there must be some motivation. Maybe the schools are better there, or the crime rates lower. No, um, just to fulfill this prophecy. Um, yeah, it was spoken by the prophet Isaiah uh, might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali toward the sea across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, uh, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. Uh, it's Jesus, right? He's, he's lit up the place. Uh, and... Um, Galilee of the Gentiles. This is one of the, uh, I think, uh, main supports of the the uh, racist theory, actually the Nazis, literally, uh, that they viewed that Jesus was an Aryan, not a Jew. You know, this, uh, I mean, I guess anything's possible, but Galilee, the Gentiles, yeah, they had a mixed population because of the conquests of the Hasmoneans. Uh, but even there, they converted everybody, albeit forcibly, uh, to the, the newly minted Torah. And uh, it, it's just uh, that that is obviously not what Matthew thought. Uh, it may mean that Jesus is going to run into a wider audience there, uh, but... Uh, 
they, uh, it's just a crazy proof texting uh, thing that these uh, these uh, racists liked to do because they like Jesus was too good. They didn't mind being anti-Semites, right? They uh, they hated Jews, uh, but they kind of liked Christianity. There was even like a Nazi church, right? And they mixed it with some pagan Nordic elements. But they wanted to keep Jesus. It seems like everybody does, you know. Hey, uh, you know we're Hindus, and Jesus was an avatar of Vishnu. Or uh, we are Buddhists, and um, Jesus was a Bodhisattva. Well, we're doing him honor there, I guess. But you know, Jesus always has. If you're in a flying saucer cult, you gotta have Jesus. Oh yeah, he was an alien and all that stuff. Uh, the virgin birth happened. It was artificial insemination and uh, this and that and the other thing. You gotta have Jesus in there. So that that's what these creeps were doing back in uh, you know the thirties. Um, uh, let's see, um, where are we? Yeah, okay. Uh, from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Is there an echo in here? Well, yes, of course, that is word for word what Matthew says that John preached. And, and you have to draw the inference that he means that uh, Jesus has seized up the fallen banner. Right, that he's, he's carrying on in John's place uh, because the word has to go out. Uh, and that, of course, is we're going to hear about that later when, when some people hear about Jesus, whom they probably have not yet seen, and they're saying, what is this? Is this John the Baptist raised from the dead because he's saying what we know John said? Interesting possibility there. Okay, verse 18, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me. Now, why do you need to know that, right? Because it's possible they weren't professionals, and the point is being made that they left their occupation. They weren't just fishing, but they were professional fishermen, but not for long. Uh, let's see, um, he said to them, uh, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. You, you, I always imagine this old Zebedee or Zebediah uh, following him with a blue streak of curses. What are you doing? Uh, you, you're leaving this all to me because you're following this nut? Uh, you, you know, it, it had to be something like that, right? What are you doing leaving me in the lurch like this? Well, yeah, that's right. Is that honoring your father and mother? Oh, well, if it's a higher calling, you know, the the whole New Testament says, uh, yeah, everybody would rather have harmony between family members, but some things are more important than that. Uh, so, uh, like in First Corinthians seven, you know, if you're if you're a Christian believer and your spouse is not, and they can't uh, abide your badgering about, no, why ain't you going to church with me? Get out of here. Uh, and and they they can't stand it anymore and div divorce you for it. Well, that's the breaks. Well, you, you don't mind uh, being a home wrecker? Well, ordinarily I would mind it, but not if I would lose a convert by saying, well, why don't you cool it and just, you know, go to the Temple of Apollo with him after all. Okay, uh, and uh, he went around about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, even though there weren't any at the time, as far as we know, that was a post-70 CE development, um, and preaching the gospel, the, the good news of the kingdom, you know, that it's on its way, it won't be long now. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, no show. Uh, and healing every disease and every infirmity among the people. 
So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. And a great crowd followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis. What is that, right? Well, that was a confederation of 10 Gentile cities on the other side of the Jordan and uh, the other side of the Lake of Galilee. Uh, uh, the, the story of the Gerasene demoniac is set in uh, uh, that, that city was one of these in the 10 uh, city confederation. So there, Gentiles are coming across the uh, the Lake of Galilee even to, to follow Jesus. Uh, let's see, uh, from the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. So like from every place. Now this is one of those things that make me think that we are dealing with fiction. Here. I mean, I, I, there are healing services in in various churches you can go see, and uh, people will say they were improved. I asked a, a woman who had been who had gone up to the healer in one of these things, and uh, that she she was like legally blind or something, and I've made a nuisance of myself, and I said, "Excuse me, can you really see better now?" And she said, "Well, uh, yeah, better." Uh, well, uh, there, there are, you know, whatever you think is going on there, whether it actually works. Often it's it's just uh, charlatanry, though. Take a look at James Randi's book, The Healers. It's been out for a couple of decades, at least. That, I mean, I was willing to grant that uh, people like Catherine Coleman were able to do psychosomatic healing because virtually all the ailments the Gospels say Jesus treated are included in uh, diagnostic manuals under the heading of psychogenic ailments susceptible to psychosomatic uh, healing of one kind or another. I figured, well, that's pretty amazing, but reasonable. Uh, and maybe that's what's happening here. But I found out I was giving him too much credit. Randy really exposed these people, uh, pointing out the amazingly sneaky techniques they use to create the impression that they're healing people. So I, uh, I'm really skeptical now. But even if Jesus could do that, Crowds of people from different countries are, are thronging Jesus and he heals them all. You're really talking about a comic book superhero, and, and I know about those guys, right? So is this really, does this sound like reality to you? It's the old principle of analogy. I mean, uh, remarkable remissions do occur, and, and sometimes they're hard to explain, but this guy going around to heal, he's got crowds of hundreds or, or thousands of people with ailments, and he heals every one of them? Mark is a little less totalistic than this, but not by much. Uh, it's like he's got superpowers, and, and indeed, that's the point, uh, because he's the son of God. But I have to admit, this just seems like we're over the line into fiction now. And uh, you know, this is a job for super Jesus. Um, maybe I'm going to hell for that, but I kind of doubt it. Um, well, I guess maybe I will call it quits there. Uh, and so we can start fresh on the Sermon on the Mount in chapter five next time. Um, remember, I mentioned how the book is organized so as to form a new Pentateuch. Uh, five books of Moses, there are five books of Jesus. Well, number one is the Sermon on the Mount, and we'll get through that one the next time. Um, you'll be seeing this after the Bible Geek, if you are if you can stand both. Uh, uh, tonight uh, at... Uh, uh, at uh, six, we'll be doing uh, uh, the Bible Geek. And if you have any questions from Matthew, uh, as you'll be seeing 
this after that, right? This is pre-recorded, uh, but you may have questions about what I've said here, and you can ask them during the, uh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is that going to work out? Well, maybe not actually this time, but in the future, uh, you will have uh, had a, a, a gospel of Matthew episode under your belt by the time the uh, Bible geek is on, and feel free to, to ask him then, as well as any that are sparked off by the, the Bible geek. But once again, let me thank you for being uh, uh, with me today. Let me again invite you to uh, share your thoughts with me about uh, whether we ought to have a third show dedicated to Gnosticism, the Nag Hammadi texts, uh, theosophy, etc., which is loads of fun. I love that stuff. Uh, or should we just uh, make that the sequel to the, the our Gospels show? And also, again, let me uh, invite and urge you to uh, click on the subscribe button. And uh, that'll really help us out. So I am uh, grateful for the opportunity to do this. I'm very grateful for your support and interest in my work. And I'll see you again soon. Thanks.